Welcome to another episode of the Gun Blog Variety Cast with your hosts, Sean Sorrentino and Aaron Paulette. Welcome to episode 158 of Gun Blog Variety Cast Radio, a proud member of the Self Defense Radio Network. How are you doing, Aaron? I am doing great, Sean. As a matter of fact, just this morning, I received a notification on Facebook that reminded me that three years ago today was the first time, the very first episode of Gun Blog Variety Cast aired. Awesome. I was thinking about, oh, you know, maybe I should look and find out what day in August it was, but you took care of that for me. So <laughs> I was yep. like, yeah, I think it's about three years now. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we've been doing this for three years plus a couple of weeks trying to get it all set up. <laughs> so I am trying to get ready for Gun Rights Policy Conference, and I'm not worried about the speech. Because I know that even if I go in and completely half-ass it, which I'm not going to do, but even if I did, I would still be better than most of the people there. That's not what I'm worried about. No. Oh, wow. What I'm worried... Pardon me? Oh, wow. You're going to be better than most of the people there. Well, yeah. Hey, <laughs> you know, I've, I've got confidence in that regard. But... It doesn't sound arrogant <laughs> a bit, Aaron. <laughs> which is so you. Arrogant <laughs> to the end. Oh, so arrogant. You know, everyone is getting on my butt for one of two things. They're either saying, no, you need to believe in yourself more, or they're doing what you're doing. I can't find a happy medium. But anyway, the point was, I'm not worried about what I'm going to say. No, I'm worried about what I'm going to wear and what I'm going to look like. (laughs) I am such a girl. I'm going through all the things in my closet. No, this doesn't fit. No, this doesn't fit. No, this is too formal. This isn't formal enough. No, I need something businessy. So I'm all over Amazon trying to find just the right thing to wear. I'm actually more worried about clothing than I am about the presentation I'm going to give. So, you know, (laughs) that's me. I'm strange. Yeah, and if I had to talk with any of these people, I would wear shorts, cargo shorts at that. And a purple shirt. (laughs) Of course you would. Because why not? Why make a deal out of it? (laughs) Because you're a guy and you don't care. Well, there's a lot of girls don't care either. Mm. So on a more serious topic, our listeners will no doubt recall that at one point during my two-month-long series on PTSD... I worried out loud during the podcast that our listeners might think that that series had nothing to do with prepping and be wondering when the good stuff was going to happen. Well, as it turns out, I received a lovely message from one of our listeners on this very topic, and he said, Thank you very much. I'd not have thought it possible, but just listening to those segments you did made me see some things in a different light, and unfortunately some walls I'd not thought were still there came down, while others I'd thought long gone snapped into place. No fault of yours. In fact, I think hearing those segments on dealing with PTSD helped me cope with it better than I would have otherwise. So thank you very much, dear listener. That really meant a lot to me. If I've only helped one person by doing that series, then it was completely worth it. Awesome. So Sean, as I understand it, you went to go see The Eclipse this week. I did. Now, I kept it, you know, real quiet on social media. I didn't post anything on Facebook. I didn't post anything on Instagram. And you have no idea how difficult that was. I had great pictures. I was doing fun stuff. And I was hanging out with co-host Emeritus Adam in Nashville. But I didn't want to let everybody in the world know that I wasn't at home. So we're going to talk about that more in the main topic segment. But the short version is I drove a lot. I left the dogs in doggy jail, which they enjoyed a lot. It was Dog Holiday Resort, which is on the south side of Raleigh. If you know the area, it's kind of behind the Walmart. Dysis is so tired still after all the playtime she got with the other dogs. And May is still kind of skittish. Though they said she had a good time. She got along with the other dogs. And I watched her through the smoke glass. She couldn't see me. And she seemed to be doing okay with the other dogs in her little play group. So it worked out pretty well. So a little reminder, it's still time for everybody to get involved in our giveaway. If you'd like a cat tourniquet and a Filster flat pack to put it on, all you have to do is join the Gunblog Variety Cast Radio Facebook group. It's GBVC Radio Group on Facebook. 
and I'm going to select a random member of that group, somebody who isn't on the podcast, and I'm going to give you your very own cat tourniquet and a Filster flat pack to put it on. So search for GBVC Radio on Facebook and join. And remember, October 7th, GBVC at the Range Complex. We're going to have a one-day, 500-round, eight-hour class with the guys at the Range Complex. And those of you who would like to find out if you really know how to shoot a gun, you really should show up. Those of you who are thinking, oh my goodness, I'm not nearly good enough to go to that. Yes, you are. If you know which end the bullet comes out, they'll show you how to shoot it well enough that by the end of the class, you'll look like a professional. Thanks to Lucky Gunner and Remington for their support of Gunblog Variety Cast Radio. From Golden Saber to Range Rounds, get a full lineup of quality Remington ammo that ships fast at LuckyGunner.com. All right, let's get on with the show. What does a number one New York Times bestseller have to do with range etiquette? Beth talks to us about range rules and expectations. I think most of us would agree that going to the shooting range requires some specific sets of rules, some do's and don'ts, some etiquette, if you will. And I know that a lot of people don't necessarily know the proper etiquette for the shooting range. So I thought it would be interesting to explore that a little bit today. And I was wondering if anyone else recalls Robert Fulgham's book, All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. There are actually some amazingly wise and profound truths to be read in the pages of that number one New York Times bestseller. And what's so enjoyable and endearing about his simple, relatable, common courtesy and common sense advice is that it all comes from what we probably did learn in kindergarten. Those time-worn rules, musings, insights, and life lessons that can benefit anyone who listens to and abides by them. You know, applicable things such as share everything, play fair, and one that I use far too often with my young children, don't hit people. I bring up the rules and expectations in this book because it honestly reminds me of some of the rules and expectations we have at the shooting range. In addition to adhering to the four universal gun safety rules at all times, there are also some etiquette basics that we should all follow. And not surprisingly, these items are very much like what most of us probably learned during that first year of school. These range basics include, but are not limited to, the following common courtesy and common sense items. Number one, follow the rules. Not all shooting ranges operate the same way, so be sure you know what's expected of you. Some of the things you might want to check are, what are the operating hours? Can you draw from a holster? Can you collect brass? Are the firing lines movable? And what types of ammunition and or firearms can be used? Number two, no basic instructions and requests. Or in the case of a shooting range, no basic range commands. It's always helpful to be familiar with the types of words and phrases you'll hear at just about any range, such as hot and cold range, cease fire, load and make ready, and unload and show clear. Number three, listen to authority. Always respect and obey the authority on any range. And listen to instructors, range safety officers, and any other range staff. They are in charge for a reason. Number four, wear eye and ear protection. This is a bit of a stretch, I suppose, since none of us likely heard that rule in kindergarten. But consider this piece of advice as similar to wear your seatbelt. And even though some facilities may not require ear protection or eye protection or both, we know that eye and ear pro are vital for proper safety and health on the range. Number five, keep yourself and your guests safe. You are responsible for your own behavior and for the behavior of your guests. Don't let anything get out of hand. Number six, be courteous of others. Unless you're the only shooter at the range, you need to be checking to see where others are, especially at an outdoor range where setup may be a little less structured. Be safe and be cautious and don't get in anyone's way. Other shooters will appreciate your courtesy and kindness. Number seven, don't take things that aren't yours. That chamber flag or that box of 22 ammo that was left behind should not end up in your range bag, no matter how much you need it or want it. Number eight, don't mess with other people's stuff. Respect the shooting range, the range's property, 
and anyone else's possessions. Basically, don't bother other people or their stuff. Number nine, ask questions when you are unsure. Don't be afraid to ask the staff, a safety officer, an instructor, or even another experienced shooter any questions you might have. They're there to help. Number 10, put things back where you found them. Your house cleaner does not live at the shooting range, so please put equipment away. Other people don't want to hunt down cones, targets, steel, or stands because you left them where you were training three days ago. Number 11, clean up your mess. I've always heard that you should leave a location in better shape than you found it. This holds true for the shooting range as well. So clean up your gear, throw away trash, and leave the range in safe and pristine order when you are finished. Number 12, warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. Okay, (laughs) you got me. Perhaps this one has nothing to do with range etiquette and a lot more to do with snack time. But I believe cookies and milk would make a perfect complement to any day at the shooting range. So there you have it. A very simple, clear, concise, and hopefully helpful way to remember some of the do's and don'ts of the shooting range. Thanks to a little information hopefully we all learned back in kindergarten. Next time you go to the range, make sure to put all these rules into place. And as always, stay safe and be well armed. You can read more from Beth at usconcealedcarry.com forward slash blog and click on pacifiers and peacemakers in the left sidebar. This podcast runs on your donations. Go to gunblogvarietycast.com and click on the donate or the subscribe button in the right sidebar. You can make a one time donation of any amount. Or subscribe for as little as $2 a month. That doesn't sound like much, but we pay our server costs monthly. And a little help from you is a big help to us. Felons behaving badly. Man fatally shot after dispute at East Charlotte sweepstakes. Dateline Charlotte, North Carolina. Charlotte Mecklenburg police are investigating after a man was found shot to death in East Charlotte overnight. According to CMPD, officers responded to a reported shooting at Queen City Skillsville in the 5600 block of Albemarle Road just after midnight. When officers arrived, they found Suspect 1, 32, suffering from an apparent gunshot wound. Suspect 1 was pronounced dead at the scene. Investigators initially said two people inside the business got into an argument when Suspect 1 went outside and returned with a handgun. However, after investigating, police said Suspect 1 and an unknown male accomplice entered the sweepstakes building in an attempt to rob it. The manager of the business told NBC Charlotte that the shooting followed an attempted armed robbery. The manager and multiple witnesses said that two men burst into the business with guns, telling people to get on the ground before the security guard shot one of the suspects. Suspect 1 was reportedly armed with a handgun and pointed it at one of the sweepstakes staff members, prompting the on-duty armed security guard to fire his weapon. Police said the guard fired one shot and struck Suspect 1. They were trying to rob the place, said the manager. Our security guard protected our customers and handled the situation. Police said Suspect 1 and the unknown suspect ran from the business. Suspect 1 was found dead in a wooded area behind the business. I'm happy they didn't hurt anyone, and now someone is dead because of this foolishness, said one witness. It's just sad. Authorities have not yet found the second suspect. Sean, in this context, what is a sweepstakes? It's one of those internet, like, lottery sort of, I don't know. It's some sort of legalized gambling, if you ask me. I've never been in one, but I've also been told that they're pretty dangerous for exactly this sort of thing. In fact, I think there was one in Florida where the guy was sitting at one of the machines and he jumped up and pulled his handgun out and chased the guy out the door shooting at him, right? And you remember how he pulled a gun out of his pocket and he held on to the pocket holster in his left hand and was shooting one-handed at the other guy? Yeah, I remember that. I saw the video. The same sort of place. So basically an internet cafe that specializes in gambling. Okay. But Sean, the headline said a dispute and that sounds like a robbery. That's one of those things that I just don't get about this article. It's a dispute in the headline, but if you read the rest of the article, it wasn't a dispute at all. It was two guys trying to rob the place with guns drawn. Well, I suppose you could say that there was a dispute about whether or not they were going to rob the place, and the armed guard won that argument. Exactly. I don't want to just point the finger and say, well, you guys are trying to spin the truth, because I don't know that. 
but it does seem kind of weird. So what can you tell us about this disputer? <laughs> disputer. Suspect 1. Discharge firearm. Occupied property. Felon. Class E. Kidnapping in second degree. Felon. Class E. Burglary in the first degree. Felon. Class D. And robbery with a dangerous weapon. Felon. Class D. So this is what happens when you try and get your debate team jacket from Felon University. <laughs> You're going to hear us talk about this in the show for the next couple months. We're taking a survey of our listeners, and we'd like you to participate. It will help us learn more about you, no matter how long you've been a listener or how frequently you listen to this show. So please take a few minutes and visit our website at gunblogvarietycast.com. You'll find the listener survey link at the top of the right sidebar. It's also in the show notes right at the top, and you can complete the survey anonymously. Thanks! This week, Miguel discusses that oft-repeated maxim of the tactical shooter. Competition will get you killed on the street. Hello, fellow weirdos, and welcome to another mental flea market. Today, I want to address one of those gun forum truths. Shooting competition will get you killed on the streets. According to some experts... If you happen to participate in action shooting sports like the United States uh, Practical Shooting Association, uh, USPSA, International Defensive Pistol Association, IDPA, Cowboy Shooting Action, or, you know, Trick Gun, you will fail on the streets when the bad guys come. Tan tan tan! It is only through the expenditure of several thousand dollars at the critics' ninja shooting academies that you will become the perfect warrior, the invincible killing machine, covering cool tribal tattoos, and wearing the beard of awesomeness. Bullshit. First, if you hear a real shit like that by any instructor, go ahead and put him in your no effing way list of shooting school. Second, if you do attend a school, and a good one, you will find out that instructors will try and participate in competition whenever their schedule allows them to, and they will prompt their students to do the same. Now, I'm going to speak from the point of view of IDPA because it's that what I shot for 13 years. Kind of retire for now, you know, reasons. So if you want to shoot something different, don't worry and do so. From what I've seen and heard, the experiences are similar. I came to IDPA via TV. I saw a show about it and found out that there was a club in my area. I did the smart thing and went to look at a match first before deciding. Two things attracted me. People were very friendly. And they were having fun. Holy crap, they were shooting and running and going down on their knees and shooting and going prone and shooting. Um, what the hell? They were prop walls and people hid behind them and sitting and behind this and simulating office environment. Oh, man, it was like crazy. And it was safe at the same time. It was amazing. You get the idea. It was not the one shot per second immutable and mooring range kind of crap. So I joined in. And the club members taught me not only the sport, but how to shoot better. Soon after that, I got the bug of getting even better. And I signed up for shooting classes with reputable instructors. Now, why do I say reputable? Because the grades were given by club members who have attended classes of different instructors and were not sure about grading them good or fucking bad. That alone saved me money and aggravation, but especially money. Competition gives you something important. It teaches you shooting under pressure. But Miguel, it is not the same as you've life depended on it. No. The adrenaline dump is not at the same level of the, you know, real life of that incident, but you do get one over and over and over every time that timer goes off, and you have a bunch of people behind you watching, and in some cases giving you loud verbal crap, and you learn to ignore and concentrate on the targets. You concentrate on what you are doing. You eventually learn to control, to a point, the effects of an adrenaline dump, because you've already been through a lot of them, I know what to expect. You understand the loss of fine motor skills, and you understand tachycycia. You heard expression of people involved in dangerous situation. Everything seemed to be running in slow motion. Well, that is tachycycia. I know you have experienced it. This will translate in other aspects of life when pressure comes at you, and instead of the usual freaking out and running around like a chicken with a head cut off, you are the one individual in control of his own faculties. And that is the individual that fixes things, gets this shit solved, saves people, saves his own life. Do you know what is the one thing that every regular competitor gets? Good firearm manipulation. When you start in a shooting competition, your gun manipulation skills look like a drunken monkey trying to build a house with Lego pieces. But the constant practice, advice from shooters, 
and actual shooting helps you improve till you achieve an economy of movement, making it look easy and without effort. That translates to both effective and safe shooting technique. And the personal note, one of the most important things I got from IDPA is to check my everyday carry equipment regularly for possible malfunctions. In IDPA, you're encouraged to shoot with the gear you use every day. And as a newbie, you may have heard about cleaning and lubricating your gun and the same for your magazines. Of course, you don't pay attention to the holsters, mag pouches and belts and other stuff, right? During a match once, I had a malfunction with a leather mag pouch. It was a little bit too loose and I dropped a magazine on the run without knowing. When I went for the reload, surprise, it was not there. And not only I got a really crappy score in that stage, but about 10 minutes of merciless name calling from my squad mates. I did learn the hard way that leather will loosen up over time, especially in the heat and humidity of Miami. The other thing I got from shooting competition, an immense body of knowledge from many people that know stuff you don't know, and they are generous with their knowledge. Maybe how to maintain and improve your gun or to what is best to arm in terms of performance, how to get started reloading, learning about first aid, detecting danger on people and stuff you've never seen before helps you know too much to try to wedge into a podcast segment. But basically it's the people. There were cops, military, pharmacists, doctors, lawyers, judges, electricians, IT people, security office, construction workers, carpenters. Almost every aspect of life was there and all of them willing to share that knowledge or help with a fellow shooter. Let me give you a quick example. I had a shooting buddy who one day showed up at a match with a face that was not all happiness and puppies. He eventually let it be known that the wife had asked him for a divorce out of the blue and she was being a bitch intending to fleece the shit out of him. We are private people, so other than offer our friendship, we did not bother him much. Later, we learned that another member, a quiet little fellow who had shot for many years with us, you know, but was very reserved, approached our sad shooter. He was a divorce lawyer and apparently a very good one because our buddy ended up not only with his first share, but then something a lot extra from a very pissed off ex-wife. <laughs> right there, man, all the ammo he ever spent got paid off. In conclusion, ta -ta -da -da! applause. Yeah. I say the competition will not only not kill you on the street, if anything, it will help you both in terms of survival and preparedness. Ignore the idiots. Listen, if this shit hits the fan, I'd rather have a competitive shooter on my side rather than some guy who went to some academy once back in 2010. I know that the competition shooter has had many refreshers on how to shoot, while I doubt that Mr. Certified Ninja has even shot 5% of the rounds sent down range by the other shooter. That's it. Go shoot some bullets. Be safe. Have fun. See you next time. Get more Miguel daily at gunfreezone.net. This is Rob Morse of the Self Defense Gun Stories podcast. I'm reminding you that this podcast is one of the many good ones on the Self Defense Radio Network. Check out the other podcasts at selfdefenseradio.net. The main topic the eclipse. So, Aaron, did you watch any of the eclipse? No, I didn't. And. You know, I realize this makes me sound like a killjoy, but I really didn't see the appeal in watching the moon cross over the sun. And maybe it's because I was living in a state where it didn't get completely blacked out. But I also didn't have any desire to drive up to Georgia or Carolina or Tennessee or wherever and see the totality. Speaking of which, I'm now looking forward to totality falling out of everyone's lexicon. It was really big for about two weeks. All right, fine, but let's stop using it. Totality. <sighs> you remember the old game Street Fighter, I think it was? Fatality. Oh, my God. Um, no, that's Mortal Kombat, you dolt. Whatever. Mortal Kombat had the fatalities. <laughs> I never played any of those games. The only game I ever played was Outrun. At least you didn't say Tetris. Let me tell you, you were so wrong on this subject, Aaron. Not the Mortal Kombat versus Street Fighter or whatever it was. I watched you on Facebook like, oh, why does anybody care about this? Oh, this is so boring. Oh, I'm so tired of this crap. Oh, and I'm like... What is the matter with her? What is it with the sour grapes? Like, you know, you can't go and see it. So you're like, oh, poo, poo, poo. Oh, no, it wasn't like that. I mean, I wasn't poo pooing on you. If, if people are excited to see it, great. Go for it. Knock yourself out. I was just basically saying, I don't see the point in spending time and gas 
to go to a place where for a few seconds to a minute, it'll be dark. Okay, it was two and a half minutes, and it was freaking awesome, Aaron. It was amazing. It was really, really cool. So, Sean, was it like totality awesome? Yes, it was totality awesome. It was fantastic. And you were going to go to the 2024 eclipse if I have to drag you. Well, you won't have to drag me as long as you pay for everything. If you don't have enough money to go see the eclipse by 2024, I'm just going to break all your kneecaps. All right? Seriously. You need to be, like, making big bucks by that point. You should be, like, on top of a media empire as the leader of Operation Blazing Sword with so much money and influence that you should be able to go and, like, have your own TV show during the eclipse. So enough of that. You know, we're not going to we're not paying for you to go. You're going to be paying for us to go because you're going to be that rich. In any case, I spent the weekend with Adam, former co-host Adam and his wife. And then on the day of the eclipse, we went up to Gallatin, Tennessee, which was about well, it should have been about 35 minutes of a drive, maybe 40. And it was like an hour and a half because everybody and their dog was out driving. And we had to take like this crazy roundabout route to get there. And we stayed with Adam's wife's brother and his wife, their family. And it was wonderful because, you know, we weren't out in a park with like, apparently Gallatin had like 400,000 people show up that day. It's like a town of 35,000 people and like 400,000 people found out that Gallatin was the place to be. And they were all in the park and then they were in the other park. And like they packed these parks up so much that there was no room for anybody to go anywhere. And we were hanging out at this guy's house. We had a big front yard. We had a big backyard. We had the house all to ourselves. It was fantastic. The weather was actually pretty good. We expected it was going to be really hot, really muggy. The humidity really wasn't that bad, given that it was August in Tennessee, right? And we'd go out, we'd take a look at the sun, and it, you know, it started. We watched it right when it started. And then, you know, we'd come back every few minutes and watch a little more. And it takes us, it's just like a three-hour process to go from not eclipsed to fully eclipsed to not eclipsed again. So we'd go back and forth and look at it. And then as it got more and more eclipsed, it was just this little crescent of the sun left. We were playing with like a colander, you know, like a kitchen colander for straining your spaghetti. Oh, you were making a pinhole camera with it. All right. We were making like... 100 pinhole cameras all at the same time. And we'd held it up and it would put this series of half moon shaped like suns on the ground. And it was it was wild. So I took a couple pictures of that and it bugged me because I couldn't send it out on Instagram because I didn't want everybody to know I wasn't at home. And then it started doing it through the trees, like through the, the gaps in the leaves. We could see them on the ground. And it just got progressively darker and darker and darker until finally the moon covers up the sun completely. The sun goes completely black. And it was so dark that the lights on the house that come on at dusk, you know, all the security lights, they all turned on. Like we turned around, we looked and all of a sudden, like it was dark and it wasn't just like a little bit dark. It was dark. So I got a couple of pictures while I was there, you know, with a cell phone camera, you're just not going to take a great picture of the sun covered up by the moon. It's just there's just not much you can do with that. You know, you get a good camera, you get a, you know, telephoto lens. Yeah, maybe you can do that. But a cell phone camera doesn't work. So I take a picture of Adam leaning up against a minivan. And then I took a picture of Adam and I sort of looking at the at the sun or what was left of the sun. You know, the corona. You weren't supposed really to see. look at the sun. It's going to burn your eyes, burn your retinas, permanent eye damage, cats and dogs living together. Ah! And see, I don't understand that. How can you stare at the sun long enough to damage your eyes without going, ow, that really hurts. I'm not going to do that any longer. I'm like, you have to work at stupidity like that. In fact, the dumbest single thing I saw about the entire eclipse was during the eclipse, take your dogs inside so they don't stare at the sun and burn their eyes. Well, do your dogs stare at the sun to begin with? Well, then why would they do it during the eclipse? The dog doesn't care about an eclipse. The reasoning that I heard is that humans will point at the eclipse and dogs are used to following our hand gestures. And because we'd be pointing at the eclipse, they'd turn and look at what we were pointing at. And they would turn and look and they would look at the sun and go, ow, I'm going to stop looking at that. I mean, like there's people out there who are so dumb that they're going to work at being that dumb and stare at the sun. But dogs got more sense than that. Like, seriously, be smarter than your dog. (laughs) In any case, the dog that was there did not care. Dog not interested, didn't want to look at the sun. Dog laid in the shade until it stopped being shade and then went romping around in the the dark. We had to keep an eye on the dog. (laughs) It's kind of funny. And the kids. 
The rule was during the eclipse, all the children had to be touching an adult because like it was dark, they might wander off. <laughs> it really was dark. It was pretty funny. But I can't begin to describe to you how awesome it was. It was fantastic. Those of you who didn't get a chance to see it, you have another opportunity in 2024. This one is going to come up through Mexico, cross into Texas. It's going to go through southern Illinois. Going to catch, I believe, Cleveland and Erie and Buffalo. It's going to stay kind of on the Canadian border up through New York and then go out of the United States through northern Maine. So all you guys in the Rust Belt, prime viewing, go. I want to go to Texas. I would like to go see it in southern, I guess, sort of western Texas. I don't know what you would call it. I'm not a Texas geography person. But basically go a little bit south and a little bit west of San Antonio. Four and a half minutes of blackout. It's going to be fantastic. And it's a desert down there. So the likelihood of it being covered up with clouds, pretty small. I checked the light and weather data for that time period. And this year... The weather was like 82 degrees in the daytime and like 51 degrees at night. This sounds like prime time to visit Texas desert, doesn't it? Yeah, sure does. Going to be all of 80 degrees, right? And 50 at night and no clouds. It rained over the course of like the 30 days, the 15 days before and the 15 days after. Historically, it's averaging something like two inches of rain for the whole 30 days. So I absolutely, I want to do this again. And catch a longer one. This time it was like two and a half minutes. I want to see what it's like at four and a half minutes. And I want to bring like actual camera gear so I can take some, those Corona pictures that I see everybody, you know, the people who do the stuff and they get the good Corona picture. I would love to have a picture of what I saw. It was just that cool. So make plans, Aaron. You definitely have to go. I have picked out a place where we can go as a podcast. So we need to keep going as podcast for another seven years. So at that point, we'll be like almost 10 years on the podcast. <laughs> we should go. Everybody in the podcast, let's go. So I have seven years to become rich and famous in order to afford the time and the, the tickets and the rental place, whatever, to get down there to Texas. Because I saw that place you picked out and uh, that is not a cheap place where you want to stay. What was it, like 600 bucks a night? 600 bucks a night is kind of what you're paying for a lot of these places that are in major cities. So it's cheap on the basis of it's not li- it's not in the middle of like Dallas or something like that. But it's also huge. And it's got like 180 acres around it and a river and like we definitely want to go there. The problem is is I think that as soon as he figures out that the eclipse is going to go right through his house, he's going to jack the price up for those days. <laughs> well, then clearly what you need to do is make reservations now. Oh, yeah, that's what we should do. We should reserve for seven years from now. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So, in addition to you being rich and famous, I guess I'm going to have to be rich and famous too. Wouldn't hurt. All right. So, everybody, let everybody else know about this podcast. Get them to start listening to it. Get them to talk to all of their gun friend people. A, to listen to the podcast. And B, maybe those people run, say, a gun business that they want to advertise, advertise on the podcast. We're going to make a whole bunch of money and then we're all going to go see the eclipse in Texas in seven years. Sound like a plan, Aaron? Sure does. Tiffany is headed up north for the very first NRA Carry Guard Expo. So what is NRA Carry Guard and what is she hoping to learn at the expo? You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view. Did you climb inside of his skin? Walk around in it. Good morning, everyone. (laughs) It's about three in the morning here, and I am in the middle of an all-nighter. The fall semester starts Monday, and I've got a brand new batch of students coming in, which is always fun. And two of my classes are brand new classes for me, which is also a blast. So it means I get to pull all-nighters and get my syllabi done and get my semester schedule planned out, get assignments designed. And I've got even less time to do that than I normally do because this weekend I will be in Wisconsin for the NRA Carry Guard Expo. 
what is the Carry Guard Expo? Well, first let's ask what is NRA Carry Guard? I certainly don't profess to be an expert on NRA Carry Guard. In many ways, it's still just a shiny object in the distance, and I am just as curious about it as the next guy, though perhaps a little bit jaded with an ounce or two of skepticism, but my understanding is that Carry Guard is the brand new, hot, fresh off the shelves, super sexy, super cool, Coleon Noir clad CCW wing of the NRA. At the risk of trafficking in gossip, I'll say I've heard that the whole thing spawned from a minor mutiny of sorts and now exists alongside the NRA training division rather than within it, which is counterintuitive at first glance, but I digress. And maybe I'm wrong about that. Y'all chime in and let me know if I've got my facts wrong. I'm not sure on all that. That's just the chatter. I hadn't really taken the time to look under the hood much yet, but they got a real slick website and they popped it up real fast. Anyway, my understanding is that there are basically two components to carry guard. One is CCW insurance and the other is CCW training. Now, I don't know a whole lot about the insurance side of carry guard, except that the prices are roughly comparable to USCCA and some of the other, you know, well-known products out there. 150 bucks a year for $250,000 in coverage, 250 a year for 500,000 and roughly 350 a year for a million, that sort of thing. But I'm sure the devil is in the details as always and I just haven't had time to read up on all of the fine print. It's also roughly aligned with the prices and coverage options for Lockton's Instructor Plus package. But again, that's that's professional liability insurance from the NRA. That's for anything that happens in connection to your duties as a firearms trainer, not as a CCW person um, in a self-defense situation. So that's a little different. Now, I said there are two components to NRA Carry Guard, the first being insurance, but the second is training. For years, defensive shooters have complained that while the NRA has our back politically and legislatively, it doesn't very much cater to the CCW crowd. So apparently Carry Guard is the NRA's first stab at answering this call. Unlike the classes offered, you know, the traditional classes in the training division, which besides the personal protection courses, are mostly built around marksmanship, safety, and sporting rather than defense. Carry Guard, on the other hand, is supposedly all about self-defense. When I heard this, of course, me being a defensive shooter, I was super excited. Not just because Coleon Noir's adorable face is all over the ads, but more importantly, because it looked like the NRA was finally starting to listen to the CCW crowd. The other thing that gave me pause, however, about the training is that, well, the lead instructors are an interesting group. They are an impressive group. I mean, really impressive. As my dad would say, they all have resumes that would choke a horse. So why does that give me pause? Well, it's the type of resumes. I'm looking at their write-ups now on the website and, you know, I see Green Beret, Navy SEAL, Special Forces, 30 Years Military, Special Warfare, SEAL Sniper, and on and on. Again, amazing credentials, and obviously I salute these men for their service, first to our beloved country, and now, uh, you know, in their private lives as representatives of the National Rifle Association. I am very curious to see how well such illustrious military careers will translate into instruction relevant to Joe Schmo, the third shift assembly line guy, or the insurance salesman, or hey, the lawyer or the college professor who's just minding her own business doing not a whole lot of sniping and special warfare. That being said, obviously there are lots of good instructors who come from military backgrounds. Don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking the military in the private civilian training realm. But what separates the good from the fantastic is that somewhat nuanced ability to fashion a training curriculum that is rooted in everyday citizen life and civilian context. And judging by the price of the carry guard training courses, holy fuck. These classes better be the greatest thing since sliced bread. $850 for a level one class? Yikes. 
Now, granted, what the NRA is calling a, quote, level one class is, in fact, a 1,500-round, three-day course that covers everything from stance to airsoft scenario training. So maybe that justifies the price, but I know I won't be taking that class anytime soon, level one or not. I am not qualified at 850 bucks a pop. <laughs> Sorry. I wonder if they have any plans to break that up into smaller chunks that are more manageable, both financially and time-wise for the average CCW holder who may not have, you know, a cool G just laying around to drop on one class. But that brings me back full circle to this weekend's festivities. Rather than pay 850 bucks for a private class, I decided to get more of a bird's eye view at this weekend's Carry Guard Expo in Wisconsin. It's basically like a mini NRA conference, but centered solely around self-defense and personal protection without all the hunting and trap and skeet and all that jazz. No offense to the hunters and sports shooters, but instead of 850 bucks, NRA Life members can attend the Carry Guard Expo for free. Yay, which is much more affordable for me. Plus, two of my good buddies and two people that I highly respect from the civilian training world have been invited to speak at the expo. John Murphy of FPF Training and John Correa of Active Self-Protection, the famous YouTube channel. If you haven't checked out John's YouTube channel, uh, you're wrong. (laughs) Go check it out. And I think I've plugged John Murphy a couple of times here before, but I'll do it again. John Murphy, FPF Training, amazing guy. His Street Encounter Skills course is fabulous very much in the context of your average everyday carrier who has a regular job and doesn't do any sniping. (laughs) Um, So I was pleasantly surprised to see that John Murphy and John Correa had both been invited to speak at the Carry Guard Expo. So I am excited to go. Um, It'd be worth the price of admission. Wait, I'm getting in free. (laughs) But even if I weren't getting in free, it'd be worth the price of admission just to see John Murphy and John Correa speaking at the same venue. So I'm looking forward to it. I will link both of their websites in the show notes and I guess wish me luck. Um, Wish me luck getting through the Carry Guard Expo and wish me luck pulling my classes together in time for the start of the fall semester on Monday. I'll be sure and report back after Carry Guard Expo with all the juicy details from the weekend. And uh, until then, you guys stay safe, keep it centered and even. And I am going back to my 3 a.m. work session. You can follow Tiffany at FrontSightPress.com. Cerakote is a polymer ceramic composite coating that can be applied to metals, plastics, polymers, and wood. It's also what will take your plain Jane firearm from basic to full custom. Whether you want a handgun coated in just a single color, your hunting rifle camouflaged for your specific environment, or your competition pistol sprayed in purple, white, and black Carolina Cryptic, you want Carolina Ceramic Coating to do the job. Bud and his team of skilled technicians will carefully disassemble and clean your firearm, professionally apply the Cerakote in your choice of colors and patterns, and return your firearm to you in perfect working order. And they also do auto engine parts. When I wanted my competition handgun Cerakoted, I trusted Carolina Ceramic Coating, and you should too. Check out their work on Instagram. Search at NC. that's at C-E-R-A-K-O-T-E-N-C, or go to carolinaceramiccoating.com. And now it's time for Blue Collar Prepping with that bratty kid sister of the gun blogosphere, Erin Paulette. Come on, every pony! It's time for Blue Collar Prepping with Erin Paulette! For the past two weeks, I've talked about what to wear in hot weather and what gear to have if your car is stranded. But what if you need to self-rescue or otherwise need to walk long distances in that hot weather? That's the topic of this third and final installment. First of all, you're going to need the right clothing, so be sure to check last week's segment on hot weather clothing. Pay special attention to your feet, especially if you're wearing impermeable boots or you're walking through a lot of water. The very last thing you want is something that makes it painful or uncomfortable to walk, so make sure you listen to my segment on preventing fungal infections from episode 143. Check your feet regularly to prevent blistering. 
If you find yourself developing hot spots, then either cushion them with moleskin from Dr. Scholl's or use something called Hike Goo, which is a cream that both moisturizes your feet and lubricates the hot spot to prevent more friction. Change your socks as often as possible, even if you only have two pairs. Get a mesh stuff bag, put a carabiner clip on the drawstring, and hang the used pair from your belt loop or backpack strap to dry in the sunlight and fresh air. This will take longer in humid climates, unfortunately. Regardless of whether it's during the day or at night, walking in hot weather is thirsty business because you're going to be sweating out water to keep cool. This means you absolutely need a way to keep water with you at all times. I recommend a hydration bladder in the largest size possible. Most brands like Camelback top out at 3 liters, but the MSR Drum Light comes in 2, 4, and 6 liter versions. You're also going to need a way to carry that bladder because water is heavy. Most backpacks these days are hydration bladder compatible, but check, because they may only go up to 2 liters in compatibility. Although a lot of bladder manufacturers also sell carriers for their products. Whichever way you go, make sure you get the lightest color possible. Your all-black, molly-festooned camelback carrier may look tactical, but the dark color will absorb the sunlight and heat up your water. About the only thing worse than drinking hot water when you're thirsty is drinking no water at all. And you're going to be drinking a lot of that water. A lot. We're supposed to drink two liters or half a gallon of water a day just as part of our regular activities. So if you're having to do hard work in the blazing sun and humidity, you're going to be sweating a lot more and becoming dehydrated that much faster. This means you need a way to refill your water reservoir. There are various types of pumps and filters out there, but I swear by the Sawyer Mini. It's inexpensive without being cheap, it's lightweight, it's good for 100,000 gallons, and best of all, you can put it right on the tubing of your hydration bladder between the bite valve and the reservoir itself. This means you won't have to take the time to pump clean water in before you can drink it. Instead, just take a bit of cloth, like a bandana or t-shirt, and put it over the reservoir's opening to filter out any large contaminants like dirt, bugs, leaves, etc. Then fill up and to drink through the filter. If you do this, keep two things in mind. You must remember that the water in the reservoir is unsafe until it passes through the filter, so don't use that water for bathing or cooking just by pouring it back out. Send it through the filter first. Second, understand that filters aren't perfect, and there's still a risk you might get a parasite from drinking unboiled water. This is a risk you'll need to take, because you will die from dehydration and overheating long before the parasites can even make you sick. Get to safety, and then you can worry about what you drank. Finally, here's a hot weather pro tip for you. Keep your mouth closed and breathe through your nose as much as possible. In fact, if you can find something clean, smooth, and inedible, such as a guitar pick or a metal washer or even a clean pebble, put it in your mouth. Not only will it remind you to keep your mouth closed, but the presence of it in your mouth will cause you to salivate. This will keep your mouth moist and help you feel less parched and thirsty. Weird sends us a message from a dark future in This, this Week, week in, in Anti-Gun anti Nuttery. nuttery. you're listening to this, I've succeeded in sending this message to the past with a warning from the future. During Bernie Sanders' second presidential term, he revealed to the people of Earth that he indeed was the Lich King and his undead armies declared martial law on the United States and repealed the Second Amendment. All guns were confiscated, which might make you think that the anti-gun nuts are now extinct. Nothing could be further from the truth. They haven't died. They have evolved. The causes of crime are complex and they're not caused by the presence of kitchen knives, screwdrivers and razor blades. Okay, I'm not calling from the future. Instead, I wanted to look at the public policy in the UK. In the 1990s, after a mass shooting, the government of the United Kingdom banned all handguns in the country and ordered them all turned in or the owners would face stiff criminal penalties. The UK had already banned all pump action and auto loading rifles. So what we consider defensive arms are effectively illegal there. Just like the United States, when such laws are passed, violent crime went up, not down. So the people who were anti-gun nuts of the UK evolved into anti-weapon nuts. What are weapons? 
From baseball bats to knives, even guns, gangs across the country are increasingly turning to deadly weapons to settle arguments. Yep, knives and baseball bats. Those are so-called assault weapons in the UK. Also note that guns are still being increasingly used in crimes, because criminals, by definition, don't care about the law. And the bans have only emboldened the criminals. They ask a youth why weapons are popular when the penalties are so stiff. If you're caught with a knife, you could go to jail if you're caught a couple of times. Does that not put people off? Well, if there's people out there who would rather like, risk it instead of them actually getting physically hurt by the weapon instead. So go, them going to jail would be a better alternative than them not seeing the next day, if that makes sense. Yep, it's illegal and they do it anyway. It's not like they worry too much about the police. These are interviews with gang members and drug dealers. If they encounter the police, they're going to jail whether they have a knife or not. So they'd rather have a knife. After years of falling crime levels, violence, including knife crime, is on the rise again. So this is a controversial figure. See, the UK Home Office, much like Michael Bloomberg's New York Police Department, were intentionally underreporting violent crime numbers. This recent uptick in crime is actually when the practices were discovered in order to stop. The only thing that can be said about the UK crime rate is it can't be trusted. But I would argue that the crime rate was going up before the Home Office put its thumb on the scale, and it was going up when they took their thumb off. So that does look like a trend to me. Now on to some embedded reporter audio. This is the Met's Northwest Area Task Force on the front line of the fight against knife crime and gang violence. Gee, is this the super safe UK or the south side of Chicago? Yeah, but they can't be after anything as bad as what happens in Chirac. There was a, uh, a murder which involved a knife, and we're going to execute a, a warrant, a search warrant, at, uh, a high risk address which is known for drug use. Again, sounds like the ganglands of America, but knives instead of guns. But I thought banning guns would bring peace and tranquility. Within minutes, they found a samurai sword, an axe, and a knife the detectives believed to be the murder weapon. This is a podcast, so you're going to have to go to the show notes to check out the video. But the samurai sword looks to be a cheap wall hanger wagasashi, and there's a rusty felling axe, and a goofy Rambo knife. I bet I could buy the whole lot for under 50 bucks online. Literally crap I have here on my desk. Except the axe. I keep my landscaping tools in the garage. And I take better care of them than these knuckleheads. Note this is not high dollar or high technology equipment. And we're still talking murder. This is the raw reality of knife crime, which has shown a significant rise across the country. And today, nationwide, police are on the offensive with high profile operations to get knives off the streets. This is stuff the average teenage boy in America has, and it's causing as much havoc as guns. And we're not just talking about blades and blunt instruments. Two teenage boys were arrested today, accused of splashing acid into people's faces in five separate attacks last night across northeast London. In the UK, they have mass aciding. Police say there have been about 500 acid attacks across the UK in a little bit more than the past year. So that's double what it was just five years ago. And these aren't isolated crimes. Even in a country as small as the UK, 500 isn't a very big number. But remember, this is on top of all the people stabbing and beating each other to death. And as police crack down on knife possession, you know, if you're a gang member, a lot of these acids are sold over the counter. They're legal substances, household items, you know, bleach and ammonia have been used in some of these attacks. It's an evolving system. Criminals aren't bothered much by the law, but if they can get a little extra help by their weapon not being considered a weapon under the law, they take it. Obviously, we need more laws. We are concerned about the, the supply of knives at street level, and one of the purposes of this operation is not only to target people who might be carrying knives, but also to look at places where knives might be supplied from. And we're doing a lot of work with retailers to that end to try and reduce the flow of knives, including these so-called zombie slayer knives that we have seen more frequently in recent times. Cracking down on places where knives are sold? Hey, have you seen my Sears branded rifle? Yep, the hardware store used to sell guns. Then there was a crackdown and a required license to sell guns. So Sears stopped selling guns. Also, cracking down on tools because of how they look? Gee, this is sounding eerily familiar. 
lawmakers are going to debate possibly, you know, limiting the type and quantity of acid that somebody can buy or carry with them on the street, maybe introduce a permit system, something like a background check system. There are no restrictions, obviously, on how many bottles of bleach you can buy. Permits and background checks. These are the same anti-gun nuts that came for all the guns. These are the people who promised safety if you gave up your lawfully held tools. They promised you safety if you gave up your means of self-defense. They said, we have the votes, Mr. and Mrs. Great Britain. Turn them all in. And violent crime went up. We, on the other hand, gave you back your tools for self-defense and are removing the archaic roadblocks like permits, proportional force, and duty to retreat with the understanding that police can't be everywhere even in a small country like England. Note that the raid teams were serving a warrant after somebody had been murdered. We gave you back your rights, and violent crime went down. Schools have been told they must do more to encourage youngsters to come forward and report fellow pupils if they think they're carrying weapons. Now, when I was in school, knives had been banned. But that's for students. I can't carry my guns on school property. But when I'm there, I do carry a knife or two. And there are no issues. People older than me used to carry their pocket knives to school. Hell, my dad brought his rifle to school the day they had hunter safety after school. There were no problems. This is a hardware solution to a software problem. Banning guns or knives or bats or chemicals won't solve the problem of violent people looking to do harm. You can ban all those things and they'll just find something else to do damage with. This won't end. Ever watch an MMA fight? Ever notice that those guys do those devastating moves practically in the nude? It's like that old quote about insanity defined by doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Gun bans and background checks in the name of safety are nothing but a bad faith argument. In addition to appearing here, Weird is a regular host on The Squirrel Report and blogs at weirdworld.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world dot com. Plug of the week, Nashville, the whole damn city. I just knew this was going to be about the eclipse again. I just knew it. No, nah, this is not about the eclipse at all. This is about the city of Nashville. Where you saw the eclipse. Well, I actually went to Gallatin to see the eclipse. I'm talking about the city of Nashville. The only reason I went to Nashville is because that's where Adam lives. He lives just outside of the city of Nashville. And on our Sunday between the time we got there and the Monday when we went to see the eclipse itself, we had a whole day to run around and see what Nashville looked like. I don't know about you, but I didn't get to see very much of Nashville during the NRA convention in 2015. Did you see much of it? No, I was pretty much in the convention the entire time. Exactly. We saw about as much of Nashville as we saw of Atlanta this year. Did you know that there was a Parthenon in Nashville? I did not until you posted pictures of it. I didn't know it was there either. Well, I'm looking for stuff to do in Nashville because, you know, got the wife with me. We're going to have a whole day to go see stuff. I'm like, so what do you want to do? And usually I choose where we're going to go to places because, you know, I'm kind of like that. And I'm like, you know, for once, let's let the wife decide what she wants to do. So she came up with a couple of things she wanted to do. One of them was to go see this Parthenon. I'm like, what the heck is she talking about a Parthenon? I look it up, and it turns out that the city of Nashville has a full-size replica of the Parthenon from Athens, except this one isn't, like, broke down and fallen apart, and you can go inside it. In fact, it's, like, the bottom floor of it is air-conditioned for all the art that's in it. It's kind of sort of an art museum, kind of sort of like it's the freaking Parthenon. So it's like the one in Greece, only better. There's better and there's not quite as good. It's not made out of marble like it is in Athens, sadly. It's made out of concrete with like pebbles on the outside. It's kind of strange looking, but it's in one piece. And inside there is a statue of Athena that's gigantic and has like eight pounds of gold leaf on it. Are you exaggerating or is that an actual statistic from the museum? That is an actual statistic from the museum. It is like eight pounds of gold leaf. Somebody sat in there and, like, put gold leaf all over this to the tune of eight pounds worth of gold leaf. And a gold leaf is, like, the thickness of a human hair or something like that. I mean, it's not like they slathered on a quarter of an inch of gold around everything. It is this super, super, like, I can't even say paper thin because it's thinner than that. 
this thing is gigantic and is covered in gold and has a giant shield and holds, I forget what's in her hand, but I got a picture of it. And it has a spear. And the funny thing is, is you'll never guess where they got the spear from. Greece? <laughs> no, it's a McDonald's flagpole. What? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I'm like, Adam tells me, he's like, hey, you're never going to guess where they got the <laughs> shaft for the spear. And I'm like, okay, tell me. He's like, McDonald's. I'm like, oh, don't be stupid. He's like, no, seriously. The sculptor, he's like, oh, you know, could really use a spear. And he's looking around and see, it's in a park. And if you go outside the park to the main street that's on the outside of the park, on the other side of that street, there's a McDonald's. And he's looking at the flagpole and he's like, you know, I could totally turn that into a spear. So he walks into the McDonald's and says, hey, you know, can I have your flagpole? <laughs> what? <laughs> Literally McDonald's donated the flagpole to, and I guess they got themselves a new one. I didn't inspect the McDonald's to see if they had a new flagpole, <laughs> but McDonald's <laughs> donated the flagpole to them so that they can make a spear out of it to put it inside the Parthenon in the Athens of the South, Nashville. That is the most American thing I have ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it though? It's just funny. Yeah. It's like, okay, so, so we're going to recreate this Greek ruin, but get this. First of all, it's not going to be ruined. Second of all, it's going to be air conditioned. And third of all, McDonald's product <laughs> placement. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not a product placement. They don't actually say anywhere this is McDonald's. I had to find out online that he was, I thought Adam was pulling my leg. I really did. I thought Adam was like jerking my chain here. Well, I looked it up and it's literally listed in like Nashville.com or, or one of the newspapers. I don't know what, but it was like fun facts about the Parthenon. And one of them was, yep, that's where they got it from the McDonald's. It's like so weird. How many years ago was that? Oh, it was in the 90s, I think, is when they put the statue in and then they okay. gold leafed it later. I don't know. It's, I mean, eight pounds of gold, not cheap. Yeah. And see, it's not just eight pounds of gold in a lump which would be whatever gold costs. It's eight pounds of gold that they had to work on a lot in order to turn it into gold leaf. So God knows where they came up with this much money to gold leaf this thing. But it is fantastic. If you are Facebook friends with me, or if you can just find me on Facebook, there is a panorama taken inside the Parthenon that includes pictures of Athena Parthenos, which is what that statue is called, Athena Parthenos. Athena at the Parthenon, I guess. Actually, no, I think Parthenon means something like Temple of Athena. So maybe somebody somebody tell me what Parthenos means. You know, send me a message. I don't know. In any case, if you look up Athena Parthenos, then that's what you're going to find is this statue. All right, so I have consulted the Googles, and Parthenos is an epithet of various Greek goddesses, most commonly Athena. An epithet. Okay, Yeah. good to know. And And it means, apparently, maiden. Oh, okay. There we go. But the Parthenon, that's why it's called the Parthenon, is because it's Temple of Athena. Why exactly? I don't know. Didn't study Greek. In addition to the Parthenon, there's plenty of other cool things to do in Nashville. I am sure that we could have done an entire week of wandering around to see stuff in Nashville had we wanted to spend a week wandering around seeing stuff in Nashville. Adam tells me that it is just flat impossible to hear a bad band in the city of Nashville. It's not that bad bands don't exist. It's just that if you're not technically good at your instruments, nobody's going to give you a gig because they got 10 other bands who want that gig. So you can go from place to place and listen to people. If you don't happen to like that particular music, well, maybe you won't like it, but they'll be technically very good at it. And it's not all country music. Is some of it Western? In fact, when we were there for the NRA convention, a lot of the stuff that we heard in the clubs as we were wandering around on the strip, it wasn't country at all. So like rock music, all kinds of stuff. So it's it's a music town. It's not a country music town, even though there's a lot of country at that town. There's a lot of stuff that's not country. So don't think that you've got to go listen to country music at the Grand Ole Opry and that's your only choice in town. Uh-uh, it ain't like that. That was a perfectly good Blues Brothers joke and you did not appreciate it at all. I was trying to ignore it, hoping that it would go away. I'm seriously <laughs> considering editing it out just so that it will go away and no one will ever have to hear it. <laughs> I do this for you, Aaron. <laughs> In any case, go to Nashville if you ever get a chance. I know a lot of you are thinking, Nashville, you know, it's country town. Oh, who wants to go see, you know, Dolly Parton and the Grand Ole Opry? Uh, it's a lot more than that. Trust me. Go to Nashville. It was fantastic. And as we said, 
the 2015 NRA convention, Nashville Nice. Everybody is super nice in Nashville. So go to Nashville. We had a great time. I want to go back sometime. And a special thank you once again to co-host emeritus Adam and his lovely wife. Thank you very much for putting us up in your home and giving us a place to stay so we didn't have to figure out where to find a hotel in a town that had like a million extra people that day. That was great. And a special thanks to Mrs. Adams' family for letting us invade your eclipse party. That was pretty awesome. I had a great time. So final reminder, join GBVC Radio Group on Facebook on October 1. I'm going to be giving away that tourniquet. And sign up for the October 7th GBVC at the Range Complex, 500 round, 8 hour pistol class. Get me a message. Let me know you'd like to go. It's in the Fayetteville, North Carolina area. You absolutely want to go to this. It's less than $200. Big fun. Come with us. Well, that's our show for the week. Remember that Gunblog Variety Cast Radio is a member of the Self Defense Radio Network. Find the show notes at gunblogvarietycast.com forward slash episode 158. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Gunblog Variety Cast. Music courtesy of Rob Allen at blog.roballen.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Google Play Music. This podcast is made possible by the Firearms Policy Coalition and by contributions from listeners like you. So basically, an internet Mother cafe milk. that specializes in gambling. Okay. Something like that. And apparently, it is now time to fucking mow your lawn. The sick the up hummingbird air force on you fucks. And now a message from Dennis Leary. A S S H O L E. Everybody. A. <laughs> Seriously here. <laughs> I'm sad. <silent>. Oh, lo, 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 lo. <laughs> God. Uh, <laughs> what is, when is Thursday at six o'clock time to pick up and mow your lawn? <laughs> Do it on Saturday like everybody else, you shit shed. <laughs> at seven o'clock and wake everybody up. I don't care. <laughs> All right, so now we have something for the outtakes. <laughs> This is a URS production.